afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our YPC Connected section, session, where we're actually going to have a talk by Professor Ruprecht um, on the SAMRAC and SAMVAL, SAMVAL um, codes. It's a brief introduction, and I guess it's a very good thing, um, you know, for young professionals to really start um, getting into because that's what really drives the value um, of a mining operation, and that's a lot of where, you know, the decisions are made within the process. Um, I'm not really going to go much into what the YPC is about because I think everyone knows what it's about, but if you do want to get more information about the YPC, I'd recommend that you go to the SIMM website and on the home page, there's a YPC tab there. It gives you all the information about what the YPC is about and also shows you all the events which are coming up for, which are hosted by the SIMM. So um, without further ado, I'll introduce our host who will be presenting, who's Professor Ruprecht from the University of Johannesburg. He's a senior lecturer there and he has been involved with the SAMRAC Working Group since 2010. He was also intimately involved with the drafting of the 2016 SAMRAC Code as the Vice Chairman of the SAMRAC Working Group. Professor Ruprecht has over 30 years of experience in the mining industry and has been involved in writing and reviewing competent persons reports, which are CPRs for in the SAMRAC and SAMVAL um, discipline since 2003. Professor Ruprecht commenced his career in 1986 with gold fields of South Africa, where he gained underground production mining experience working at Fintersports Gold Mine, East and West Prefontaine Gold Mines, and Luerdoorn Gold Mine. In 1997, Steve, Stephen was moved to head, of, to head office as group mining engineer, and he also worked as a senior engineer in coal. And in 1999, he joined the CSIR Mining Technology um, Group as the research area manager and worked extensively on the deep mine and future mine research programs, which um, quite some very interesting work actually came out of, uh, out of that. Um, in 2003, Stephen joined RSG Global as a principal mining engineer until 2007, when and then he joined and until 2007 when he joined Keaton Energy as a technical director a position in which he held until 2009. In 2010, he joined the University of Johannesburg as a senior lecturer and is currently an associate professor. Prof professor Ruprecht is a fellow of the South African Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, the SIMM, and is a member of the STEM Council and is also a member of the SIM Technical Program Committee. The DEMI Task Team, the YPC Committee as a Council Advisor and Chairperson of the SAM Code Standard Committee, which is the SCC. And I guess personally, like we've had lots of interaction with Professor Ruprecht in the YPC, and um, he's done a lot of work um, with the YPC in terms of setting it up and actually getting it running, and has also given us a lot of guidance um, as we go about our duties as the Young Professionals Committee. So without further ado, I'll hand it back to you, Professor Ruprecht, and we're excited to, you know, hear your workshop. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to give you um, um, two hours, a brief introduction about the codes. Um, there's a picture so you can see me. Uh, we've had my introduction. The agenda, like I say, the first is the first session is to give a general introduction to the reporting codes. You know why they're there, that type of thing, history. Uh, second, se uh, second, I can see I already have a typo. And the third section will be the Sam Val code. And then we'll do some examples and then we'll have uh, a bit of questions. And like I said, we can have the questions at the end of the presentation as well. The idea is around 30 minutes per, per session. Uh, session one might be a little bit quicker and session two a little bit longer, but that's the idea. So session one, general introduction to the introduction to the SAM codes. And I think many of us, um, might have heard uh, Mark Twain's famous quote about a mine as a hole in the ground with a liar on top. And, and that surely was uh, the history of the silver bonanza in Nevada back in the 1880s where Mark Twain uh, was a newspaper reporter. And uh, there was a lot of salting of mines and a lot of dishonesty going on. And then we move 100 years, 110 years later, and we find that some of these things are still going on. And I always enjoy the quote by, uh, you know, uh, Warren Buffett, you know, we honesty is a uh, is very expensive gift and don't expect it from cheap people. And the problem is, is at times we do have people out there that are not as honest as they should be. 
So I'll real briefly talk about the BRIEC scandal, but uh, that really led to the, the requirements of the codes and, and the Poseidon Nickel uh, burst, um, the bubble and burst that happened uh, in Australia uh, also was a pre-leader to these things. And in both cases, people lost a lot of money. So go back to the 1960s, towards the end of uh, uh, the 1960s, we had the Vietnam War. Um, Poseidon Nickel uh, made a discovery in Western Australia. And if you look to the, to the right, you'll see the share price went booming up. Um, and great things, you know, happened. Uh, $280 a share when it started. However, um, it wasn't based on great, great geological information. Um, you know, the extraction costs were higher than expected. The grade lower than uh, originally thought to be, um, which is typical. And when the Vietnam started, Vietnam War started to um, slow down, uh, the, the need for nickel dropped. And hence we've got this crash and the unlisting of the company. So a lot of people lost money and, uh, you know, not a great thing. And then the BRIEX, that was, you know, the real uh, big scandal in 1997. And there, a lot of Canadians, a lot of pension funds, school pension funds, government pension funds, a lot of people lost a lot of money. And this one was um, pure hoax. Um, the geologist on the right, uh, right hand side, the Guzman, basically took gold from alluvial deposits and salted the core that he was drilling with it. And when another company came to do a due diligence on it, re-drilled next to it, Freeport McMoran, when they drilled next to the other holes, they found no gold. Um, so obviously this crashed <coughs> and the um, probably the most famous thing about it is the Guzman, uh, well, it, it's not known whether it actually jumped out of a helicopter or uh, and died or he's still alive today. A lot of people believe he's, you know, he pulled off the, the best scam and, uh, and basically left with the money. But this was what really preempted uh, people and, and, and that's the importance of the codes. Um, if we want to get money from investors, they have to believe that we're trustworthy and honest. And these codes allow us to put some uh, confidence for investors in it. So you can, you know, just a brief uh, picture of it. You can see from 1971, uh, the Jork Committee was formed and that really came from the Poseidon nickel bubble um, where people lost money. And over the years, it, it kind of moved. Um, and basically in our mind, we really started working on this in, in 1992 um, with the SAMREC working group. Uh, and, 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 and you can see it as well. In 1995, we've got the Valman published, which is about how we value uh, properties. And it went on like that. And the, the other background you can see is where we are now to basically in 2016, we we've redid the code. So we had the code in, in basically 2000. Um, and then we redid it in 2007, 2009. 2016, and you'll probably find that over time we'll uh, do another rewrite and update to fix up things and as things change, um, it will happen. Okay, so if we talk about Crisco, um, uh, and you will, by the way, all these slides will be available for you to look at um, and to have, so there's no problems with that. So you will be able to look at these in more detail uh, when you you know when you have more time. But Crisco is a non-government organization that is basically um, the overview of all the code. So as of August two, uh, 2019, we had 14 members. Um, currently, the Philippines and a few other countries are thinking about joining. Uh, definitely the Philippines, China, Argentina. So we're getting a lot of um, interest in, in South America um, and in the eastern side of the world. As you can see, uh, Africa is, is very white there and 
really the, the, the companies that are working in Africa will be reporting uh, under either SAMRAC, JORC, or often the Canadian uh, CIM uh, code. Um, so, you know, I don't think we'll see a lot of, although um, there has been talk about Africa creating their own code, but um, we won't see that for many years. It's just hard to get everybody to agree on things, okay? So the background to the code, it really became vital. Um, we know that mineral, uh, minerals are very important for our businesses. And we know that if we want to develop a mine, which often takes a lot of money and capital, and hence we need investors, we need the investors to trust and have confidence in what we do, as well as, uh, as, well as other stock stakeholders, you know, so, what we needed was these uh, codes that allowed people to have more confidence in what we do for us to communicate what risks might be associated with the project but mainly it, it allows people to get at an early uh, an early point uh, at the investment and if they get it right can make a lot of money but um, obviously they the reports the cpr is confident person reports inform them of how we determine the resources, how we did the reserves and, and that kind of work. Um, so the background um, on the right hand side, there is the reporting code that we're using all over the world. Um, the code has 15 standard definitions, which is very important because the, an accountant anywhere working in the world or anybody working in the world wants to know confident that if I'm in South Africa and you say a mineral resource or I'm in Australia or Canada or South America, a mineral resource has the same definition for all everybody reporting under these in international codes. So we don't have any misinterpretations. When you say per proved, what I mean is proved and how you perceive it if you're an Australian or a European will, should and will be the same um, with maybe minor differences, but they will not be material differences. If we look to the right and we'll, in my next presentation, we'll be talking about uh, the, the code, uh, the SAMREC code. So this is the SAMREC code and this is basically how we will be, how we would um, report mineral resources well, exploration results, firstly, mineral resources, mineral reserves, and to move from a resource to a reserve, we've got these modifying factors that we need to report on, on an if not, why not basis. Okay, so that's just a, a bigger update, a, a bigger picture to it. Um, and note, uh, for us, we use the term proved, not proven. Uh, Canada uses proven with an N, we use proved with a D as does most of the rest of the world. So just be aware of that. Um, some people say it's not important, but to me, if you're a competent person, you should know when you're reporting on a SAMREC code, whether it be coal resources or uh, coal reserves or metallurgical reserves, you need to use the right term. Um, if we look into just providing the background to the, the SSC, which is the SAM Codes Standards Committee, uh, which has a, a run, which overview, which basically overviews or overruns the SAM code, um, which is the SAMRAC, uh, SAMVAL, and SAM, SAM OX, which is oil and gas, um, that overruns it. And you'll see that in our committee, we have numerous people that are involved or numerous players uh, or organizations, sorry, that are involved with it uh, to pro provide uh, information and things like that. So um, you can see uh, there is a lot of backup to it. Um, it's not just the SIM, SIMM or GSSA. There's a lot of people that go into this. And when we do updates, they look at it and make sure that all their um, um, constituents are also represented to it, okay? Key to it, although we fall under Crisco and AMVAL to overview our SAMREC and SAMVAL committees, um, I think the, the important thing is to understand that we are um, operating under the SIMM and GSSA who put money to 
towards us, uh, a budget towards us to allow the, the SAM codes to uh, have meetings and discuss things at, and send representation every year to the annual international Crisco meetings and inval meetings. Okay, so if we look at our codes, those are the three main codes. So what we have are codes, um, SAMREC, SAMVAL, which is what we talk about mineral assets. And if we were talking about oil and gas, they have a separate code for oil and gas. And it's important to note, we also have guidelines. So recently in 2017, uh, SAMES, which is Environmental, Social and Government, they have a guideline to inform us on how to ensure that we do good reporting that is meaningful to, for stakeholders. And we have a special guidelines because of diamonds being the way diamonds are. They're very special gemstones. We have guidelines to help people report on, on that as well. So the guidelines is something that you consider. The codes, you must adhere to certain rules. And then underneath, we've got the recently um, updated SANS document, which is for the standard uh, SA Bureau of Standards on evaluating coal deposits, which is a very... Um, comprehensive uh, uh, detail on if you're in the coal industry. So if you're working in the coal industry and you are doing resources, coal resources, you definitely would like to uh, have that standard and you'd be using it. Um, the importance, so it, it's important that one remembers that what we provide is we say the, we give the minimum standards for reporting exploration results, mineral resources and mineral reserves. So some companies will go out of their way and really work hard to do very good reports. And what we're there, there to try to do is just make sure some of the smaller companies that um, maybe don't want to put the effort in, we make sure that they at least maintain to that standard. And again, it's about credibility, um, that people feel confident that the work that is being done is not fraudulent. And so they have some kind of uh, assurance that at least is based on on good competent work and and not uh, any hidden uh, agendas so we want to promote high standards of reporting and maintaining trust of the investors and other things so that's that's the key thing um in the tent of the uh, and, and then the intent and tone of the codes it, it, we still we want high standards but we still align ourselves to uh, um, peer reviews and self-policing. And that, that's important. So uh, we, we're probably not doing as well as we should on self-policing. We see things at times that aren't right and we don't complain. And sometimes people get away with not um, doing what they should. Um, things are improving in terms of at least um, annual reports that's being reviewed by the JSC every year. So that's improved immensely. But what you have is these small reports that do not go through the JSC or be are reviewed by the JSC readers panel. And those reports, sometimes they say it's a competent person's report, but when you open it up, it's not quite a competent person's report. And that's where we, we as uh, peers need to put in complaints. Otherwise, somebody else will start uh, policing us and, and then you have accountants or someone else who do, doesn't understand mineral deposits and mineral assets uh, regulating us. And that's definitely not where we want to be. Guiding principles, um, in my mind, if you follow the guiding principles of the code, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's easy. Um, we, you know, we want anything that's material should be reported. Um, we have a table one at the back, which I'll talk about in the next presentation that has to be reported on an if not, why not basis, which ensures that every question or section does have an answer to it. So we, we, we want transparency. We want any, and, and we want competency out there. Um, and so that's, and that's what the goal is. And, and the key point is we don't want, and it's easier said than done. At times, this is not easy, but we don't want CPs, competent persons or competent valuators to be unduly influenced by 
the people that they work for or, their, or the people that have hired them. You know, so that's very important. And you know, one of the things one must understand why these importance are are uh, why these codes are important. And this is a very busy slide, but what I want you to to focus on is the long time it takes to get from the beginning where you're looking at deposits and you're getting your exploration rights, et cetera, et cetera, to where you actually start uh, really bringing, you know, starting a cash flow is a long period. Um, and to do this upfront work takes money. Um, some cases it might be $400 million. So we need this money to pay for the work that needs to be done, exploration drilling, test work for metallurgical studies, geohydrology, rock engineering, uh, feasibility studies to, to get funding. So this takes a lot of time and money. And we at, during this period, we have investors investing in our mining company. If they don't believe the work that we're doing, then they won't invest. And then we won't be able to bring projects to, you know, to books. So this is what it's all about, really. And that's why we, you know, we want the codes to be um, as best as they can. So it's really about transparency and disclosure. That's what we want from the reports. Um, and, you know, junior say corporate governance is a hinder to some of their objectives of making money. Yeah, there is work involved in this uh, for small companies. Uh, it can be sometimes daunting, but as soon as you are borrowing money from the public, um, we need to protect, you know, the old saying of protect the widows and orphans. All right. And the comment is, you know, over time, if you don't do it right, you will be punished. Uh, the, the market will punish you. They won't invest in you. Um, just quickly on enforcement. So we do have enforcement. Um, one can make complaints to the competent, where the, the competent person, a competent evaluator is signing under what, uh, you know, whether he's a, a, a fellow of the SIMM or uh, a member of the Engineering Council of South Africa. Um, so we have uh, statutory bodies like EXA and uh, professional bodies like uh, the SIMM and GSSA. Depending on where the person is signing uh, under, um, you can go to those bodies and make a complaint. If it's on the stock exchange, you can go to the JSC and make a complaint. So. There is an enforcement policy in there. Um, each each of the um, uh, ex uh, SIMM, GSSA, uh, PRI um, uh, scientists all have a code of ethics. They all have a disciplinary committee, and those are the things that will enable you to to be a competent person. So one of the good things that we have in South Africa that is probably um, leading practice is is we have a, a JSC readers panel. So listed companies at times will be required to put a, a competent persons together. And, is, and we have basically, depending on the mineral that they're riding on, we have a team of about 18 geologists, mining engineers, evaluators, that from there we will pick out who is suitable to do the work and review it. Just, and, and the important thing is, it ensures that the CPR is compliant with the, the, the SAM codes. Uh, it does not vet that the work done by the competent person is correct. That's still for the competent person's, uh, that's his responsibility, he or she's responsibility, but it ensures that they follow the guidelines that all the things that they needed to report about have been reported properly. And that, that, that's what makes it uh, uh, quite a nice system. And like I say, many of the other countries uh, look and say, you know, they, they look at it and like it, yeah. So, you know, we're striving for better transparency. Um, obviously, we always can do better. Um, I think over time we have done better. The, the 2016 um, SAMREC code, the, the latest edition, introduced the if not why not if not, why not basis? And, and that was very important to ensure transparency that 
material aspects have to re be reported on, on a transparent basis. And, you know, and the key in, in any of this reporting is if you're transparent and anything that's material, material you report on and you report rather too much than too little and you do your work from a competent person's a competent base doing work that you are competent to do, you won't have problems I and mean, common sense will prevail. But these codes are there to kind of just uh, ensure that we're playing the game right. So that's the, the, the background um, to, to the, the codes and now we'll move into the codes. Um, I'm not sure if we would like to take a quick uh, at this point and maybe take some questions or move on to the, um, you know, to the next set of slides and do the questions at the end. So um, if there is anything while we're busy just putting up the, the next set of slides, we can answer some quick questions if need be, if there is any. Yeah, hi. Um, there aren't any questions yet. That's good. For that as well. Yeah. Okay. So session two, um, this goes back more into the, into the SAMRAC code itself. Um, I'm doing a very high level, uh, um, study of it. And, and I think the comment I, I would make, uh, the, 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 the code, the more you read it, the more you, you learn. And I still, it's either you forget or, or you're not sure, or a different question comes up. But I'm forever reading it and um, learning new nuances to the code. So I think it's one of those things that you're forever learning. Um, and as the code gets updated, there's some curveballs to it or things change. But even when you have this sorted out and you know, I mean, I was part of writing the code. There's still things that come up and there's still things that I still go to uh, other people and I query. And, and there are one or two things that I think should be changed that I don't agree with. Um, but that's for, you know, maybe another three or four years from now when we do an update. So this we've kind of um, already talked about, but it just gives you a little bit more idea of we started in 1994. It took a number of years to get going. Um, and yeah, and we are now on an if not, why not basis. What are the benefits? It promotes best practice, accountability. One of the key things, common language, con common con concepts. Um, we might have a slight difference of opinion. What is a conceptual study going to be? What is a pre-feasibility? But they're not materially different. And, and although I will say, and uh, it, it might not come up later, one of, my, one of the problems we still have, and, and this is typical of the code and where we're still working on it, is steep people, competent persons still abuse the definition of a conceptual or a scoping study and will use it at times and say it is a pre-feasibility to justify the conversion of resources to mineral reserves. That has happened a number of times and it's one that we're trying to address. Again, it can come through complaints, um, but you know, it, it's saying things aren't always perfect, but we're trying to, to, to go as best as we can. And again, if you see something wrong, you need to report it for the good of our own industry. The idea is, again, these reports minim minimize risk. It identifies risk so we can mitigate them, et cetera. It's relevant to South Africa, Southern Africa, and, and, and the code is used elsewhere as well. So, but mainly in South Africa and Southern Africa. Um, one of the things we always want to remind you, we don't do oil and gas, we don't do water, we do minerals, we do coal. Okay, that's important. We're not, uh, you know, we, the code does not apply to oil and gas or water. Um, and this, as I mentioned, if, if you can remember this, the principle of the codes, materiality, anything that's relevant, you should be reporting on. Re so the purpose for people to make a reason and balanced judgment. If you do not give me enough information, I cannot do that as a uh, person in the public domain. Transparency, we want it to be clear. One of the things that we'll probably be changing in the next rewrite, or at least I'm gonna be pro proposing, and this has come from the Americans with the recent uh, change in the SEC, Securities Exchange, 
they're, they're asking for um, uh, what, a, a principal English, just a good principal English, basic, simple English, get away from technical terms that a lot of people don't understand and that might mislead them or they just don't understand it. So that, that's one of the things we'll be working on going forward. And then again, competency. Anybody who does a work must be qualified and experienced. And a lot, again, it comes back to A, from your own point of view, asking yourself the same question, am I competent? Can I do this work? Can I face my peers? Um, and uh, if you can't, uh, you shouldn't be doing the work. Uh, so yeah, and again, the relationship, uh, a highlight, at times we might have areas we're measured, which typically would go across as proved. We might have times where maybe we are missing some information or we're not confident about a few parts of it and we could downgrade a measure down to probable. So again, we'll get into more detail as we talk about it. But again, I can't cover everything, but one of the other key things um, about reading the code is, is the, the code itself, which is a normal type uh, face. Uh, we've got definitions highlighted in bold text and form part of the code. And then the guidelines are in italics and, and give you some uh, in place after the respective uh, code clauses. And it gives assistance and guidance to the reader how to interpret it. Um, so you kind of get that in the code when you see it. Um, and another comment would be, you know, obviously at times if you have questions, ask a peer, ask a friend. Um, we do that all the time. Even myself, I'll, you know, when we have a trick question, we ask one of our colleagues and we uh, answer that reasonableness of what we've done. Um, do, Important part is as we go down the table, we're moving from uh, um, a low level of scientific knowledge or confidence. And as we get to measure, we're getting very close to having a better understanding. You know, the, the kind of words work with it. You know, you infer it, it's indicated to the point where you can actually measure it. So those are key point definitions. And on the table, when we report, we go from low to, to high confidence. If we talk about expiration, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to cover all the uh, all the points here, but the key thing about expiration uh, results, and we also talk about expiration targets, is there are projects where we we have an idea there might be some minerals out there. Um, it could be a, an alluvial alluvial diamond deposit where we know that in the river. Um, there's going to be diamonds in it, it's upstream, downstream. So we would call that a target. And then if we're reporting that target to potential investors, we would provide that as a range of tons and grade to indicate that it is a expiration target. But we need these targets at time to allow us to get funding to carry on with our exploration work. Um, so it might be, we might start with a desktop study, discover target, do some work on it. We may still call it a target if we haven't got enough information, but if we have enough, we'll then report it as exploration results, which again is important to note. Um, it is hot, uh, it, it, you, you will report it. Again, it allows people to understand what's happening, but you do not have enough confidence to declare it a mineral resource nor does it have enough confidence to have this thing called RPEEE, -E -E, which is reasonable prospects of e eventual economic extraction. And that is what we use to, um, to test whether a deposit can be a resource, a mineral resource. So, you know, as we get closer, there's my RPE, triple E. Um, we we want to look at Sorry, touch my mouse and it moves, but we want to look at these outside things, geological, engineering. Um, we need to understand legal infrastructure, social, political. You know, am I, am I, um, is my deposit within a, a, a national park? 
which I might not be able to get into. I've seen people not realize that the park boundary has moved and part of their deposit is in a, is in a park. You can't mine it. Or it could be in a wetlands or a, a nature sensitive area. So these things might exclude you from declaring a, a resource. So those things have to be considered by the competent person who would be the geologist. We tend to start with inferred. Um, and again, we don't have as much information, um, but it's the, the deposit is inferred from geological evidence and sampling. Um, it's assumed but not verified geologically or uh, through an analysis of the, the grade continuity. So if one was to be honest, inferred is probably one of the areas where, although we've, we've in 2016 have made the definition a little bit more confined, it's still sometimes a little bit of abused. Um, it's one thing to be careful about. Uh, an inferred resource is just that. Um, you don't have enough confidence in it to convert it from uh, to a mineral reserve. Um, we're in South Africa, can use it. Um, we can use it, and we're one of the few countries that can use it in our mine design. Remember with the deep level gold mines and all that, you can't go and drill uh, a new Witwatersrand gold deposit or even a deep level platinum project, uh, you know, doing a, a 50 or 100 meter by 100 meter drill spacing. It just doesn't make sense. So this infer does come in. The important thing is if you're using inferred, um, you need, it should be associated at times when you're also using measured and indicated. And when you use it in the life of mine plan, you need to disclose what that plan looks like with and without the inferred uh, mineral resources included in the plan. The next level we go up is to indicated. Indicated gives us enough information uh, about our geology and our grade continuity. It's still uh, not as good as we may want as measured, but it's enough to enable us to do mine planning and enables us to convert indicated to a, a, a probable reserve. But this is, this is where we can start declaring reserves if we have done a, a pre-feasibility study or more on, on the project. Um, and again, that's the most important thing. Um, it's appropriate, but uh, we would, like I say, for ensuring economic viability, we would like a portion of our project usually to be upgraded to, to measure, especially for the payback period. In other words, until I paid back all my capital and I paid the bank back or whoever I borrowed money from, I would like to see measured. Uh, it's not a you must, but that's kind of the the you know the uh, rule of thumb so measured means we've got a good handle on the locality we understand the geology and the grade continuity and that's really what what we want to do um, again one of the key things to understand except for coal which does give some guidelines on drill hole spacing your deposit is up to you on how you want to do your drill hole spacing. It is up to the competent person to decide what is appropriate to uh, the spacing to decide whether it's inferred, um, indicated or measured. So that's an important part. Um, so if you look at the measured, you can see a lot of drilling, a lot of delineation, del delineation. Um, you shouldn't have, there shouldn't be any reasonable doubt for the tonnage and grade of the mineralization. Um, it can be uh, estimated to close limits. Um, that said, we still find, um, we still find that there are some resources that are declared measured and with more infill drilling, they disappear. So again, it's, we try to get it right, but, um, it doesn't always happen that we get our, uh, our competent persons get our declarations or our categories correct. So one has to be aware of that and, and be, you know, under, truly understand it. 
Okay, I mean, I've seen uh, a, a project what lo lost two years of its life of mine, and you say, well, two years isn't too bad, when, but when you only have a, an eight-year project and you lose two of it, that becomes quite serious um, in terms of money, in terms of valuation, in terms of share price. Um, yeah. And again, one wants to understand that mineral resource reporting is, is not, it's, it's not a calculation. So one of the things we highlight is you must use the term estimation. And we still see people talk about calculation. And the problem is, is we do, we do do our, our, our estimation and we use the Excel spreadsheet. We do calculations, we get an answer. But you must remember this estimation, so it's important that the numbers are approximate. You can see down here, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the 2 plus 2 is 3.984, and, and that's not the, the, the case. So you'll see when we're reporting resources and reserves, we don't report to, you know, to the last decimal point. We don't say there's, you know, 52,653,400 thousand four hundred and twenty two tons we'll we'll round it off to show that this is not a precise calculation because we do not we cannot estimate to the last ton you know maybe to the last hundred thousand tons depending on the de deposit so again just be aware of it the key when we get into now we move from resources to reserves so when we talk about resources and reserves we're talking about including our dilution, our contaminants, our losses. So we're applying mining factors to it and we're applying modifi modifying factors. Key is to know that in order to declare a reserve, you must conduct a life of mine study that is to a pre-feasibility level of accuracy. So if you're a new project, you must do a pre-feasibility or a feasibility study to declare a reserve. Um, if you're an ongoing mine, you might want to only just update your life of mine schedule. But the information, and this is some of the guys don't get this right, some of the bigger companies as well. That life of mine schedule for the entire life must be based on information that is to the confidence level of a pre-feasibility pre study, which is 15 to 30%, 15 to 20%. So you need, you know, and that's important. Okay, and that's basically what I'm saying with, it, you know. So be careful. And again, we see people will say, well, I'm using all my modifying factors from this mine. I'm now going to move my pit um, 26 kilometers down the road. And I'm going to assume I'm going to have the same modifying factors, the same dilution, the same, same, uh, losses. Now, a deposit is 26 miles away. It might be the same ore body. It might be the same coal seam, but geologically, a lot of things can happen in 26 kilometers, you know. And did you think about the transportation costs and things like that? Your costs will be different, but, you know, your overburden might be different. So there's a lot of things one has to look at it. And if we look at a probable um, mineral reserve, Again, based on a pre-feasibility uh, pre study, usually it's going, to be, um, it's going to be based on indicated. But again, there's enough information that we can do mine planning on it. Um, there's a little bit more doubt in our ore body if we're from a, an indicated side of things. Or there's some of the modifying factors are still being settled and maybe not 100% confirmed and that would be maybe why a person might move from measured to, uh, to probable. Um, what is, so one or two of the things that does come up where you, you, can, um, uh, you can consider. So say I, I have a, um, a project, I've applied for my, my uh, water use license, or I'm still busy negotiating or finalizing my marketing terms and conditions. 
if there's no reason to believe that these things will not happen. I mean, we know it may take two years to get a water use license uh, from, from the government, but if there's no reason for it not to happen other than it just takes time, you're able to declare a reserve based on that. But you need to discuss it, you need to highlight it, you have to be transparent. So those are the important things. Okay. Proved we've moved up and, and what they're saying, we have high level of confidence uh, usually it's going to be based on measured. Uh, we know our mining method. We should understand it, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The, the next point uh, that we talk about is inclusive and exclusive of, of, of our resources. So what has happened uh, as of next year, the, you, anybody who's registered in the United States, any company that's registered in the United States will need to declare the resources um, exclusive of the reserves. So, and we at this stage allow us to do either or. You can do it either inclusive or exclusive, depending on how the competent person wants to do it. So, if it's inclusive, it means that there is my mineral resource, that big red blob. And in that resource, I have my mining area that I'm going to mine. And I will then report the reserves inclusive of the resources. So if I were to say I have a hundred million tons of mineral resources and I have 50 million tons of reserves, my resources are hundred, my reserves are uh, um, 50 and they're inclusive. What happens is when you do exclusive is now the blue blob is outside of the resources now. And when I'm reporting it now, I will say my mineral resources are 50 million tons and my reserves are 50 million tons, assuming that each color is equal. And that means I'm now reporting my mineral resources exclusive. And in that assumption, I'm also assuming that all of these areas in the red blob are still going to be mineable. But really what will happen in the real world is you might find the red area that is underneath the blue, this area here, maybe it's too small. I won't be able to mine it or something. I might have to exclude that now because I don't know, I no longer have reasonable prospects of eventual economic extraction. And then maybe my exclusive mineral resource, resource might actually move from 50 to maybe 45 million tons. So something that you, you don't need to understand 100% right now, but just be aware of it. There are two ways of reporting and the competent person must clearly state which way he's reporting, inclusive or exclusive. And why this is gonna become more and more important is as of next year, companies will have to report exclusive uh, for the American market. And you know, that they have to do. So we're gonna to start to see more of exclusive. Okay, modifying factors, there's nine of them. You need to look at them all. It used to be, it used to be, which is my next slide, that we would be, as engineers, we'd look at the engineering things, mining, metallurgical, economics, infrastructure, maybe legal, you know, market, we didn't get too worked up about, but we didn't get, definitely didn't get too excited about an environmental, social, and government. That has changed. That is now no longer the case. You have to look at all of them. And in fact, you know, I think you're going to find that your environmental, social, and government are going to become more and more critical, uh, especially um, after closure costs. How long is it going to take? How long do I have to monitor and, um, and rehabilitate or treat a closed mine? And in one, you know, recently, and I can never remember which mine it was, it was in Europe, um, you know, the closure of the mine actually costs more than what they had actually earned over the time. Of course, they weren't taking um, into account the time value of money, but still, it's a very scary thought. Okay, I mentioned about um, uh, self-regulation and it's still very important that we um, uh, need to 
do our own um, regulations. We need to do our own reviews, our own assessments. Sorry, I see my slide got a little bit uh, moved over. So it's not review as s. It's supposed to be assesses. So again, we want to make sure that we're uh, looking after ourselves, um, and you know we should be questioning our peers more than we do. And I'm, as I mentioned before, if there is a complaint, one can take it to the SSC, which you just to the general manager, the SIMM, <clears throat> you can report to the GSSA. They would then report it to the relevant parties and in action. So if it comes to the SSC, we'll see, you know, who, where the person signed under, and then we would look at it and, and send it on for their own statutory body to, to handle the, the issues. Okay. So, so far we're doing very well. I'm on time and on budget. Um, okay. Can I, I, I can answer the one question. So the, uh, the one question is um, how does one ensure that our RP triple E um, for resources in an open pit or underground? Um, so it's a good question. It, uh, you always have to have an idea. Um, in order to have a resource, you should have an idea of what you want to do with it. Um, uh, is it going to be open pit? Is it going to be underground? Um, sometimes it's not as easy as that. Um, I've had a case where initially it was going to be an open pit mine and the model was made um, <clears throat> for an open pit operation. Um, and then, then you, it, it, when we looked at it, we said, no, no, we've got a power line, we have this, this, and then we had to go and go down and look at it as an underground operation, meaning we're now not trying to mine a 12 meter low grade, uh, high volume deposit, but a narrow vein uh, deposit. And um, which causes a little bit of problems, but you need to, the geologists had to make some changes. So, you know, you have to have an idea in order for you to, to you know, you're gonna probably start with the surface. You're going to look at, you know, the grades, you're gonna get, uh, what happens is you're going to talk to your peers about, okay, what are typical mining costs? What are typical recoveries? And you will look at it and say, and, and then you use a, a, a metal price that is appropriate. And normally when I look at a resource or people that look at resource have a little bit more leniency. So you can say, well, the gold price right now is at close to uh, $2,000 an ounce. You could probably use that for your resource. People might say for a reserve, that's a little bit optimistic because we know the gold price will go down. So in order to do that, you need to first check what you think it's going to be, um, get the relevant information. So there are there is information out there in the public domain. It could be other competent persons report. It could be InfoMine data. Um, it could be just talking to friends where you're getting enough information that you can just on one or two pages do the quick calculation, say, does this have a chance of working? If it does, I'm okay. If it doesn't, then you might say, well, okay, do I have to consider this maybe a high grading or, or look at it differently? Um, if it's underground, I would then I'd have to use underground costs. So it doesn't have to be a high level. It just has to be a, a reasonable approach. And like we're saying, we're, we're saying roughly at this stage it's one or two pages. What's happening though, this could change in the near future. Again, in America, they're now requiring this to become a little bit more um, uh, in depth. Um, and the reason up until now, we've, we've kind of been pushing back on making this resource declaration a formal report is we're not trying to create, and this is my take, my personal take, a lot of times, a lot of consultants want to, to enforce this so they can get more work because the mines and exploration guy might not have enough time or knowledge to, to do this. In comes a consultant and money's you know, being made. So we're not here to create a business for consultants. We're here to, pop, to protect. And, and if a company needs a consultant to do that, that's fine. But we as, um, as a committee, when we're driving these, we're not out there 
um, to make it harder. Long answer, but I think a very important one. So one of the comments I just want to say um, before I move on to this introduction, you'll note what I tried to do in the first uh, session and the first slides I've highlighted uh, and gave uh, relevance to the SAM codes and the SSC and all the, the, the people. Um, but you'll see for the most part, the slides are under University of Johannesburg because um, I think it's only right that um, the company that is paying me to do the presentation, which is University of Johannesburg, that we, we use their, you know, their, their uh, branding so they get a bit of credit. And uh, so we haven't forgotten, it's on, not by mistake that we have University of Johannesburg. It's, it's uh, SIMM obviously and all that, but um, I think we just need to, uh, when my boss asked me what I did, you know, for the week, I can say, well, I was working on this presentation and uh, it doesn't get upset. Okay, so if we look at the SAMVAL, um, the SAMVAL is really about how do we put a value on a mineral project? And, and maybe I must just highlight that when we do technical studies as scoping studies and feasibility studies, we are doing basic technical evaluations, evaluations with an E. When we do the SAMVAL, we are evaluating what is the value of a, a property. We might want to sell it. We might want people to come in and buy in. So there's a numerous, there's a, a lot of reasons why we might want a valuation. Um, and so we need to do it right. We need to make sure that it's clear. So we have the same principles as the SAMREC, except we also have included, the SAMREC guys have included this thing called reasonableness. Is it reasonable? Does it make sense? You know, so that has come into it as well. And some of the guys, some other codes use this reasonableness, but you, whether you have it here or not, we, you always using this reasonable person's concept. Would a reasonable person do it? If yes, then you're okay. That's why we're always, um, you know, doing the work in order to defend it among, uh, to our peers. That if a peer asks a question, he's gonna, you know, would most likely agree with what we're doing. So reasons why, many reasons. Um, and so you can see them there. I'll just, you can look at them as quickly as I can. And then to go back to the guiding principles. So same issue, um, we didn't go into, uh, you know, it, it, you know, just another slightly different way of saying the same thing, you know, pertinent information should not be omitted. Um, because it can affect the judgment. We want the reader, the public, to have as much information as possible. So now that's critical. Transparency. You know, it must be clear, easy to understand, unambiguous, plain English. And that's what, like I said, this plain English, pr plain English principle will be coming, I like to think will be coming up uh, through our next rewrite. But definitely in the United States, they already have that. The Canadians pretty well require it as well. And then competency. Can you do the work? Do you have enough skills and um, um, an experience to do it? If not, what you would probably do is work under the guidance of you do a lot of the work. If you're working for a bigger company, you as a junior can work, uh, do a lot of the work, but have it reviewed and signed off initially by by another person. Once you've done a couple of these, then you say, yeah, I now have the experience. You know, again, we're talking about a three year, th three year period that one understands it and uh, has a good understanding. And again, is it, um, is, is, is the um, work that we do broadly comparable to the range of values that other people would use using the same uh, principles? And again, you're always going to have difference of opinions of value. That's, that's, uh, that's the, difficult, the, the difficult part of doing valuations. The owner always wants more money or the seller always wants more money. The buyer always wants it cheaper and somewhere you're in the middle trying to give this reasonable approach to it. So again, 
yeah, and just to kind of comment about from Eric from it kind of highlights, you know, um, about reasonableness thought to be had. I like that. Uh, again, you can think you've had that time to read it. And then, so the, the, the in a nutshell, the Sam Val has three fundamental approaches. And SAMREC requires that we use two approaches for a competent person's report or a competent valuation. So many are competent person's reports should include a valuation section. You need to do two methods and select which one you, the preferred mesh method. So the first one is a, a cash flow. Um, it relies on value and use. So it's basically, you're gonna use a discounted cash flow. You're gonna come up with a, uh, an NPV and you're taking um, into account future, you know, so you're, you're gonna be discounting it and you can get a value. That one's probably the easiest because you, you're gonna be doing it. You'll see as we move further, um, you're gonna be doing that for a mine that has reserves, there's a lot of confidence, a lot of work. You have a schedule. Life can be very easy using a cash flow. Market approach is, gets a little bit trickier. Market approach is based on this willing buyer, willing seller. And the best energy, uh, I've now totally said it wrong, but anyway, is like selling a house. What you'd be doing is you, you, you have, um, it's like saying, I have a three bedroom house, I have a swimming pool, I have a double garage. And I've seen that this house and houses in the same neighborhood maybe go for 1.5 million for that type of house. He, uh, you know, another house with four bedrooms, uh, two garages and a pool might be go a little bit higher and, and maybe if it doesn't have a pool, a little bit less. So you're using this, um, this approach of you're trying to do like for like. And so if you have a similar type of deposit, you would then use the market approach and often we'll use it as like dollars per ounce or dollars per ton of coal, uh, that type of thing. And we would use that um, to get an evaluation. So at the end of the presentation, I um, for later on, I do have some examples that when you get the presentation, you can look at, um, at at these different little presentations. I won't do it through the the, the discussion to, tonight, but you can see it. And then cost approach is more towards your expiration sides where you, you spend money um, doing preliminary geological work. And depending on how much work you've done and how you've developed the project into, you know, Maybe you've drilled one or two holes. You've hit the you've hit coal or seam. You've you've up the value. You, we would use a enhance an enhancement evaluating a P, PEM and and that we might say well because of the work you've done um, the value of this exploration project might be three times the money you spent. It might be one time uh, one times the same amount or it could be twice the money you've spent on on upgrading this project. So that comes into the um, realm of the competent valuator. So you can see cash flow is very straightforward. Market approach and cost approach very much has a bit of an opinion, you know, to it. It's not, it's not cut and dry. It, it's definitely an estimate. Okay. So again, the guiding principles again for, for the, 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 the valuation code, the SAMVAL, very similar to the to the SAMREC code, but again, same thing. And I think this one is probably more important in valuations than, well, even, even in resources, uh, there's always this tendency of, of people to be pushed, um, CVs being pushed to give more than what they want, um, want to give. There's, um, pressures from companies, they want higher values. And it takes, a, it takes um, good experience and good confidence levels to ensure that you, you're confident in what you're doing and you're not being bullied by somebody else to um, do work or, or put a value that isn't there. It's a real concern.
Okay. So just to highlight what we were chatting about now, the value in use. Okay. So we would run present value, putting your capital, all the things, like I say, straightforward DCF um, kind of work. And again, the market approach. And again, arm's length transactions. So again, willing buyer, willing seller and cost. It also includes a bit on if you have plans on doing extra um, exploration work, you've done work so that that can be value to it that you've um, started to look at where I'm gonna be putting more uh, drill holes or more exploration work. Um, so that comes into the equation as well. Uh, again, that is based on work done and insight that you've gained from working the project or developing the project area. So you must be impartial. And again, you'll see the CV must be satisfied that, that the work has not been unduly influenced. And the problem is, you know, when you're, you know, real life uh, problem, uh, is when you're doing these valuations for your client, you know, you, there, there is this tendency to want to make the client happy. You want the client to come back to, to you for more work. So it really does go down to, at times, testing your ethics and, and, top, uh, and, and really um, making some hard decisions. And, you know, I know colleagues that have been in, you know, really um, terrible arguments with clients because of these values. Um, and, you know, it's up to the, um, like I say, we would appreciate more that the clients would understand uh, that, you know, this is important that we do the work. It doesn't help to do in, improper work because of the re reasonableness test. Someone looks at it and says it's wrong. Then you wasted your time and effort. Um, the valuation standards. So again, one of the key things on the valuation um, is the competent uh, evaluator must make sure that there are, you know, they, they should have information going on with the competent person's report. They should understand the technical aspects of it. Um, they should understand the even the geology. Um, not in full detail, but enough to understand what's going on because where you run into problems when competent evaluators are, are looked as um, outsiders, they only do this one little silo of work, which is evaluation. And that's the wrong, you know, the wrong work, the wrong way of doing it. The competent evaluator is going to be reliant on the geologist, on the mining engineer, on the engineer who does infrastructure, the environmentalists, the marketing, all these people come into it. And although the competent evaluator is signing off for it, often what we do is we highlight um, that these are the people we're reliant on and competent evaluator must ensure that they look at this and uh, ensure that, um, that they're happy with the work done. Don't take it at face value. And the table, again, this is in the figure one in the Sam Val report, but you can see where you might use your income approach. And you can see, as we move from early on stage, early stage exploration, advanced stage, development of, prop, development of the property. Here's where I've started doing my pre-feasibility studies. I'm using it now. If it's a dormant property and it's not viable, well, that won't work, will it? Market, you know, we might, we, we can use it here at early stages kind of goes right across, doesn't it? And then costs really down, at, down here and again, not gonna be used up there, all right? We'll use it for de defunct properties. So you can see market, market's going to be there. And then just kind of a, a curve that, uh, that we often see, you know, uh, cost approach, market approach, in income approach, so, realistically this income approach actually which is a cash flow approach um, starts really here in the pre-feasibility study so there it is there so just ways of looking at it so 
with more confidence, you're going to go with the DCF type of way. Just another way, kind of a picture to show uh, what the table looks like in a picture. And then I, I, I highlight, you know, it's generally acceptable to use mineral resources in an income approach um, if mineral reserves are present. So again, we might be using inferred um, in it, or we might be using um, resources that have not, that are remaining, that maybe not have been included in the life of mine plan. One must be very careful with this information. Um, so where measured and indicated uh, mineral resources are used in the income approach, um, one must understand the, the, the level risk that might be associated with, with it, especially when we start talking about inferred, which I'll talk about just now. So one must understand the risk. If I'm using indicated or measured, obviously indicated has less uh, confidence, okay? And use of inferred, one must be very careful. Remember, we're not allowed to convert inferred from inferred to a reserve. There's, there used to be many years ago, a thing called a possible reserve. That was taken away when the codes came through, it was agreed we will not have a thing called inferred reserves um, or possible reserves where we convert inferred to possible. So we're saying inferred, we don't have enough confidence to do mine planning. Yet, when we're doing valuations and we, we are able to apply modifying factors to these inferred resources to enable the valuator to put a price to it. However, one must be careful with it. Again, if it's only inferred, you shouldn't be doing it, but people sometimes do it and they shouldn't. It's only when it's associated with indicated a measure that had been converted to probable improved reserves. Um, so this is one to be very careful about. But yet there are times we need, I might have an exploration project or a project that has inferred. I need to put a value to it. So sometimes there's this pu push that the competent person or the competent evaluator is going to use this inferred information in a mine plan um, to do the to do evaluation. Okay, so if if you're going to do it, beware, be careful. You might have a, a different factor to it. Uh, one of the key things that probably will help you with most of this when you're looking at it, if I'm using it in a in a, in a mine plan or I'm using it. I would be using it late in my cash flow where my discount rate is going to be very, very low. So I might only get 30 cents on the dollar or on the RAND. So the, the, the influence of this inferred hopefully isn't, uh, doesn't have a high or material impact. Where you have to be careful is where it's brought up too close, too soon, very, uh, very close to the start of the mine. And if you bring inferred in there, it can be a very um, dangerous thing. So use of inferred, whether you're putting it into evaluation or a, a mine plan, one must be very careful with it. I think that's the key outcome. Okay. If you're one doing it, you must make a, a clear statement of the level of confidence that you have. You would highlight the risks that are associated with it. Um, you might, you would definitely want to disclose the reasons why you're using a uh, the the cash flow method, um, and you know reasons why the valuation may or may not be based on a SAMRAC compliant report. So again, if if you don't have a compliant report, you must highlight that as well. Um, and then application, of, you, you must apply the application of one or more approach. So even though you're going to be using um, the cash flow, you're going to have to look at the market as well. Or if you're going to use costs and market. So you always have to apply two of them. And then if you're going to use inferred mineral resources and put into cash flow, you need to highlight what modifying factors you're going to use. And they should be the same 
um, that you've used for the feasibility study or the pre-fees or, or the study that was used to move um, your resources to a reserve. So again, the caution at this early stage. So, um, you know, what we highlight here is be careful. Uh, resources with reserves. When we use, when we, we use modifying factors um, on inferred, um, we must know that it's very uh, speculative. Um, it's inferred. We don't know if all of, you know, the key thing is we don't know with further drilling if all of the inferred resource will be upgraded to um, indicated resources. What has happened in 2012, uh, 2016, is we changed the definition saying that with further drilling, we would expect, we would expect inferred to be able to move up to um, indicated, yet there's still the clause saying, but there's no guarantee that will happen. So that's why uh, one has to be careful. And the reason that I'm spending so much time and, and highlighting this is, this is the area where we have the most um, gray area where people don't always use it correctly. And if you um, do see reports with infer being used, you know immediately that it, it kind of waves a yellow flag that you need to slow down and look at it a little bit more carefully. Um, it's not to say that it would be wrong to use it. There are times when it might be appropriate, but there are times when it's inappropriate and still being used. So one has to be careful. And then again, we talk about scoping studies. Um, now, in we, we, we use scoping studies internally to, to help us make decisions. Um, one must be careful. Uh, again, a scoping study have, has an accuracy of between 30 and 50 percent. It is not enough a confidence to um, declare a reserve or to convert a resource to a reserve. I need to do a pre-feasibility level. So again, one must be careful that one is not using a scoping study to justify using a discounted cash flow for your valuation because it's not really right, is it? So again, one must be careful again with that. There are times the Canadians allow us to do what we call preliminary economic assessment, which is where we do have a scoping study um, and it gives the investor some information noting that it isn't a reserve. And that's what I'm talking about there. So these preliminary economic assessments, we do use them. Um, they're good for internal purposes. They, 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 they give you an idea of the potential viability of the project, but one must be careful, uh, especially as a competent person or a competent evaluator, we're very careful that these things aren't misused, that you do a PEA or a scoping study, and then the person that you did the work for is using this as if it's a done deal as a feasibility study. It isn't, it's a scoping study. So these are things to be aware, you know, be careful, um, you know. And a lot of times people can make it sound more sexy or interesting. And I say, be careful of the blur. Scoping study is not a PFS. And again, if you are doing um, a scoping study and using it, it's important that you put the cautionary wording and advice to the reader as to that limitation to the study, you know, um, and it doesn't always happen. Once you give a scoping study out, you don't always know where it's gone to. Um, yeah. Okay. So the intention to me, um, the intention of Sandvale code through exploration and development properties that use cash flow is meant to be applied to projects where the, the viability has already been established and the, the marketing cost approach should be used for projects that require further work to establish viability. So in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is, is that, um, you know, you, if you, you've got, um, if you've got, uh, inferred resources that or 
um, yeah, you know, let's just say inferred resources that are associated with, with other um, proven and probable reserves, then it might be appropriate. But if there's no work been done, then it would be inappropriate to use a cash flow and just apply uh, modifying factors to a um, inferred resource and then do a cash flow on it without there being other measured and indicated resources with it that are in a mine plan. So again, there are those that disagree, but again, you know, I guess that's a matter of principle, but uh, there's always someone trying to uh, push the envelope. So again, be careful with these. All, uh, the, the most important thing is when you see these things, just be careful, is the right words being used, enough wording, um, because often these are used to mislead the public and it goes about, uh, you know, transparency. Are you being transparent? Um, you know, so under, you know, highest and best use, we're normally assuming that extraction will take place. So that's one of the key uh, other points that's in the um, code that sometimes not always understand, but we normally assuming that yes, extraction is is going to take place and that's how we are going to look at it. In terms of um, our reporting, um, one must be careful, whether it be a competent person's report or um, uh, a competent evaluation, uh, often guys will tell you, ah, it's, you know, it's just a quickie, it's just a cheap, you know, I, I, I once did a, a small uh, scoping study for a, a client and the next uh, month he's coming back with 10 mining engineers and a whole team as if this was a, a, a pre-feasibility study. And it was a very high level. I don't even know if it would be a scoping study. It would be plus the 50% mark. You know, does this have a hope of working? The next thing you know, the client's trying to sell it, you know, as something that it isn't. Um, so you got to be, you know, you got to be careful of that. Um, just at the back, like I said, I do have some examples of market approach. Um, and again, you know, you can have a quick look at them when you get it. It just shows you how you would get to a, a, a value for, as an example. Um, competent persons reports are also out in the public domain. So you can, you know, when, when they are out there, you can look at them and use them to, uh, to understand in more detail um, how that works. Okay, so again, normally we would spend probably twice the amount of time on, on these things with more examples, but it's a you know, short introduction comment would be um, the, the codes are there, they're on the SIMM website, um, they're there to be, to be looked at. Um, so the first question- yeah. Go ahead. So the first question is, is there a rule of thumb concerning the proportion of proved and probable reserves in a mine plan? Um, some mines operate with over 80% probable reserves, which could be risky for the valuation of the company. Yeah. Look, the, uh, the, the, what we, what we, my, the rule of thumb from a mine planning point of view is I want, the rule of thumb we use is I want my, um, my cash flow or my design schedule to have proved reserves at least up to my payback period. After my payback period, I might, I, I, I'm, I'm happier to have uh, more uh, probable. Um, what we see is so you know and that that could that, you know that could be at least forty uh, percent. Often you know we would like I, I know one company uh, and one has to be careful about it and you got to understand how people are applying applying it. One company I know what they do is they might have measured, but until they're actually mining that area and that block, they will convert the measured to probable. Uh, until they mine. So if it's later in the, the life of mine plan, it will be probable regardless of it, you know, whether it's measured or indicated. And the reason 
is they want to be a little bit more conservative. Um, and only once they start mining those blocks uh, and understand the recoveries and the grade will they, so mining areas will be, will be proved and non-mining areas will be probable by definition. That might be too conservative. I mean, if you really have a good handle and you really believe that your resource, um, you know, uh, is, is, uh, is good, you, you could argue if I've got measured, I should, you know, convert it to, to proof. Um, so my, my rule of thumb would be use the life of mine payback period um, as a rule of thumb. Um, 80% is pro uh, probable is a bit too low. You know, we, we would definitely want it higher. Um, so yeah, I do agree it is risky, but um, that would be the kind of number I would be, I, I would say it depends on your life of mine plan, but your payback period for sure uh, will be uh, required. Banks often will also require that payback period should be measured. So okay. in terms of the rest, it's not hard fast, yeah. Okay, um, thanks. And then um, the next question is, can you explain the differences between RPEEE, a scoping study and pre-visibility? Yeah, so the RPEEE is for the geologist. Um, the geologist needs to be assured that uh, to move from this exploration result and to become a mineral resource, you must have reasonable prospects of eventual economic extraction. And this, this is one of those weird and wonderful. So it could, in the code, it talks about like iron ore might have a window of over you know, 30 to 50 years, coal, 30 to 50 years, gold would be less. So there is this gray area of how long is your window of opportunity for one being a, you know, a big one, but, you know, we use almost like a, not even a scoping study, just a high level, um, high level uh, calculation estimation to justify that, you know, if I assume the mining costs and, and, and I'll go to the metallurgist say, look, typically for this kind of deposit, what kind of recovery will I get? I haven't done the test work, but typically we'll get, you know, 90% for gold. Cool. Uh, what's the typical cost? This is the typical cost. So I'll use that information. I'll do that from the mining engineer. And he'll say, well, how deep is it? What stripping ratio do we, we look at? And we say, oh, it looks like a two to one stripping ratio. Therefore, I can come up with a mining cost. I know the size to a certain degree, the size of it. And I can kind of estimate the tonnage and I can apply it. That's how much I'm going to mine. So I know the cost. I know the GNA and I can kind of get this RPEE. It's like a, a really mini, mini scoping study. Scoping studies and pre-feasibilities are very much more intense. They, they go through a lot more detail in everything. And therefore, um, you know, a scoping study can be anything from, you know, say, you know, 100 pages to 200 pages. You know, feasibility study, pre-fees might be, several documents it could be you know 300 pages or it could be numerous volumes of information but a lot more detail goes into it where the the reasonable prospect of uh, eventual uh, extraction economic extraction is really more of a high level um i mean you could even do it on an excel spreadsheet to justify it and you would be fine i i hope that kind of clarifies it so the best way to do it in layman terms would be it would be a a really fast mini scoping study that would maybe take you uh, maybe a day to get all the information. You know, it might take you a little bit longer if you're working in isolation. Okay, and then the third question. Um, the third question is who does the auditing? If you're a CP, I'm assuming. If ever there are shortcuts found in the report, how can I be penal How can I be penalized? So it all depends. The, 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 the problem, I guess you'd say, is there's a lot of, there, there are a lot of reports out there that they say they're competent persons, but only when you're, if your client is like putting it onto a, um, a web page, sometimes they do that, or it gets into the domain, um, 
then because we do see uh, the, the, we do see some really shocking CPRs. So there's no formal auditing process unless you're going through the JSC for a listing report or on an ongoing basis, your internal annual um, integrated annual reports will also be reviewed by the JSC. And if you have to put out a document to the public, to shareholders, that will be, re be reviewed, reviewed, not audited, reviewed for compliance on the reporting. Did you report what, on the items that you were supposed to? Um, we don't, the JSC does not audit the work to make sure the work is done right or wrong. That is for the competent person. So the, the problem that can happen and, uh, is if you aren't doing your work correctly, you can be penalized. But to be honest, most of the time what has happened and, and the principles that we're out after is we're not trying to punish somebody. Uh, look, if you do fraud or you're purposely doing something for monetary gain, which is fraud, then, you know, the, the weight of the law will come after you. But if someone makes a mistake due to miss, uh, you know, being misinformed or just making a mistake or bad judgment, what we tend to do is then say, you know, we will inform them, look, you've been found wanting. In one case, we made a, a competent person take a class, take one of these, uh, like this kind of presentation. We have an advanced course once a year, then that person would have to take that course. Um, but there's only been one occasion, and that's when it first came out that a geologist was sanctioned and was unable to work um, as a competent person for six months. Otherwise, up until now, it's been more we're trying to correct, you know, bad behavior, um, provided that it's, you know, not uh, done in a fraudulent, fraudulent manner. But the real audit, uh, auditors out there will be, um, will be your peers. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And my, com my final comment would be, we're actually not doing enough complaining. Um, there's a lot of things out there that should be uh, taken to test that aren't. Yeah. No, that's true. Um, but I guess the peer review process um, is only as good as the peers themselves. So I think yeah. it will take time. Yeah, um, the exactly. Last, yeah, the last question is diamond ore bodies or kimberlites are very complex with varying internal geological lithologies or facies, varying grade distribution within the ore body, et cetera, as well. Um, what are the guidelines applicable for reasonable reserve estimates for diamond okay. mining projects? So I, I guess I have to put the, 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 the thing as, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not um, a competent person in, in diamonds, but I have been a, around them. So I, I have to always, you know, I guess say, you know, speaking under correction, what, what we find is with diamonds for that very reason, diamonds, you rarely see anybody declare a reserve. They're very hesitant to declare a reserve. Um, because of the, the, the nature of the beast. What you'll find that, you know, normally you'll, you'll end up taking a 50 ton sample um, and you'll end up taking, you know, and finding out how many carats per hundred tons, et cetera, et cetera. What you'll find most of the time is that they still will be reporting in resources and not reserves. Um, speaking under uh, under correction because of that um uh, there's such a um uh, you know you, you almost want to say with a diamond you don't know what you have until you actually got it out um again so that would probably be better if tanya marshall were here who's our diamond expert um but that that's probably the best i can answer it at this stage like I say, most of the time, you don't see a, a reserve estimate. You only see resources because of that nature. Okay. Yeah, no, agree. So usually what goes into the mind plan is the indicators. And then you need to state up front what is actually inferred within your mind plan. And that's what's still at risk. But then because of the nugget effect and 
because of the of the nature of the ore body itself or the the resource sorry um you can't really you never see the measure ah. being actually the yeah. being reported yeah i'm i'm taking you you you're in the diamond game so you know more that you you better to answer that than me yeah but like i say i don't see reserves um um yeah i I, I, I go to as far as a scoping study level on diamonds and then after that I run away because it's, it is very specialized. Um, and I, the only other comment, and don't shoot me for saying this, uh, the diamond is one of the areas where you do see a lot, of, a lot of weird and wonderful, not so much on the majors, but the juniors. Um, there's something about a diamond mine. You get people that invest in them like horses. I have a, I have a racehorse and I have a diamond mine. And, and, <laughs> and it's frightening what you see out there at times. You know, I saw a guy once, he built the plant without doing any work on the ore body or on the deposit. And you, not an ore body, a deposit. Um, and, um, <laughs> and that's frightening. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the last, uh, we'll, I think we'll be okay. We're, we're a little bit over with the questions, but I think you know, we've, we've stolen from the other end anyway. So just a couple of case studies. Maybe um, before I start, uh, you know, one thing I didn't highlight, which is very important, and we, I corrected myself now, is you notice I, I mentioned the word uh, ore body. Um, one must remember, um, and this is very important, um, when we're talking about resources and reserves, you only can use the term ore body after your deposit has done a pre-feasibility study and you've declared a reserve. Ore body means that it is, it is mineable, that you can mine it at a profit today. That is the definition of ore. Um, so people will sometimes use the ore body when they're talking about resources, mineral resources, and that's incorrect. So you only use ore after you've done that pre-feasibility feasibility study. Um, and it's something that sometimes people will forget. Um, and, and yeah, we use the term ore all the time and I correct myself when I do it because ore is very specialized. You've, you've made a hurdle. So just be aware of that one. Okay, this might, this shouldn't, I've only got about 12 sides and just to highlight some of the, the poor, what we've seen out there in the, the, the public domain. So this is a, an example that one was, it was, was in a, in a, in a um, uh, magazine, Endeavor Mining, uh, a number of years ago. And you'll see what they give you, they, they've given the deposits, um, and they give a 100% basis attributable and all this, and they give you proven and probable reserves in ounces, measured and indicated resources in ounces. And yes, like the code says, you, you separate inferred resources from measured and indicated, and they've reported it. But what, they, what, they, what they've only told me is the ounces. They don't tell me the tons, and they don't tell me the grade. So... You know, I've had a person come to me once and he, you know, you, you can, you, you can have a number of very small, thin seams of, of mineralization, but you can't mine them, you know, they might be separated so much that you can't eco economically mine the individual seams or veins, yet if I were to add them all up, and this is what the guy did he came from um, uh, Barberton he said oh but I have you know 600,000 ounces of gold here and then you get well okay that sounds pretty interesting doesn't it you get there and then you find there are all these little micro you know five centimeters ten centimeters and he has it throughout the whole thing uh, the whole uh, dip of the deposit but the problem is is most of this is underground so if it was open pit maybe i might be able to do something with it but it's underground and all of those ounces converted to saying to him my friend you have nothing because you can't mine it and that's the important thing you know so again an example you never report you can do ounces but you've got to make sure you give myself tons and grade you always have to give tons and grade otherwise you're not telling me anything. Ah, 
Next one. So another one, similar type of thing, annual report a few years ago. If you look at this, it all looks wonderful. You know, it's in the table, you know, you can see the modifying factors, but you know, if you look at it, what they're doing the same thing. Um, this is reporting platinum and chrome. So I've got 356 million ounces of 4E, but at what grade? Can I mine it? Okay. Blue Ridge Platinum also had millions of ounces of 4E platinum, but the grade is too low. And that's why it's still on, I don't even know, it's on care and maintenance. It basically hasn't operated for 10 years because of the grade and the dilution. So again, here, you haven't told me what, what my grade is in, in, what my grade is in platinum, grade in tons, nor have you, you know, here you've told me uh, the chrome that I have, but again, what is the grade? Will I be able to sell it? Because just having chrome, you know, maybe it's 34% chrome. So you might read this and say, wow, I'm gonna invest in this, but will I be able to sell it? You know, so those things come into, so again, not transparent, not giving me the information I need to make an informed decision. But it does look pretty impressive. And it goes into a, an annual report. So, you know, this is in the public domain. They would have gotten a letter from the JSC explaining to them, as per the code, you're not allowed to do this. Um, you know, fix it. Okay. Another one, um, you know, gross tons in situ, reconnaissance. Um, again, uh, didn't want to go backwards. Let me fix it. Again, you know, it doesn't tell me anything. The, you know, reconnaissance is almost like a an expiration target. We don't have reconnaissance actually in our, our definitions and of the codes. They do, they do use it, uh, you know, the coal guys do use it, but if you're reporting to, to the, you know, to SAMRAC, uh, you need to use the terminology that is acceptable. And then you go here, you look at this, you got these coal, all you know about the coal is the tonnage. You don't know if the coal is going to be washed. You don't know the value of the coal. You don't know the, uh, the, the color, uh, the CV of it, you don't know the volatiles, you don't know the sulfur. So there's so much information missing. Um, and yet, you know, this is going into their, in their annual report. So again, problems with it. You know, don't divide. So you're not allowed to, you know, you need to divide proved and probable. Um, so yeah. And then another one uh, that came out, um, gross tons and such same, same thing. And this, this, I think we finally gotten this through. So 10 years ago, the coal guys, um, and if there's any coal guys out there, you know, I'm sorry, but the coal guys, not everybody, but many, especially the juniors, were out there reporting only tons without giving the coal value, which is quite good, you know? if I'm a coal miner, because the devil's in the detail. This is meaningless to me. I don't know if you're going to be able to sell anything, if the coal's worth anything, you know. I need to know my values, you know. Um, what kind of CV do you have? Uh, what type of vaults? Because if you're selling it to Eskom, Eskom will only take certain coal. Um, if you're not, you know, if you're selling it somewhere else, uh, again, um, can be a problem. We've seen reports where people are saying they've got a, an, an A-grade coal, uh, or, or they use, let me rephrase it, use an A-grade coal price for the feasibility study, but the coal quality is a C-grade coal. And, you know, so never the two shall meet. So these type of things are uh, often uh, bad habits. But I was saying, with the coal guys, over the last 10 years, we've been with the, the complaints and the things we are reporting a lot better than what they were doing. So um, another one. Um, and again, this one probably, you know, I hate when they, people are using the term proven, um, you know, it's increased, you know, it should be proof cold reserves. Again, 
same thing. They've they've given us a run of mine tons. They've given us a sellable ton. So you can start to see what can happen, um, you know, from saleable tons primary. Um, but again, we have no idea about uh, coal qualities. And again, it has improved over the time. So here's a good one, a good example by SRK back in 20, 2009. It, it, you know, and, and another thing, we, we, if you look here carefully, um, and this is a very important point. Um, yeah, you can see it. Here we've got the seams. I got B, C upper, C lower. Um, I've, I've seen coal companies when the C upper is not a good quality coal and it has low volatiles, they don't give us the C upper and C lower. What they only do is they might only give us C. And so there are competent persons out there still, still to this day. And th this is not by accident because one year they did it and the next year they didn't. Um, and because there was a question, but hold on, your volatiles are too low. You cannot sell that to ESCO. Um, so a lot of times people will hide things. And like I say, I don't think this is by accident information that when I combine the upper and the lower, the CV looks right. When I combine the upper and the lower, maybe the sulfur looks right or the volatiles look right. But when I'm looking at them individually, there can be a problem. And so those are things to be weary of. And so there are guys out there that are, are abusing, they're still abusing the system. So there's still room out there for us to go out and do some peer review or for me. Uh, okay, and then another example, um, the last example where um, this happened a number of years ago, uh, where a consulting company did not do the test work on, 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 the, on the copper they assume, so it's like me being um, out in the, you know, the bush field and I say, well, typically we're going to get an 84% an recovery on my platinum project, no problem. I didn't test it, I just assumed. And yet there might be for some reason, an element in there that maybe misbehaves and you only get a 60% recovery. Well, this company had, had guaranteed to deliver certain products out there um, and uh, you know the company didn't do the work properly they ended up having to pay fines etc cetera, etc cetera. and because of that um, the the client the, the consulting company actually was in this case actually you know sued for the work you know so we we run across these issues um, you know of, of bad work. Uh, sorry, this is not the copper one, but this is the gold one where they didn't do the crushing work. But there's another example I often use is the copper one where they didn't do the copper recovery right. This one is they didn't do the work on the crushing system. So uh, it was a, a problem. They had to spend a lot of time and money. This one was a quite a quite a serious one. Um, and they didn't also get the, the, the grades, the recoverable grades that they thought they were getting we're going to get. So kind of a, a bit of a double whammy. Um, so what happened, you know, it, it, the, it got down almost to reduce to a year, the project, um, and it just became a, a nightmare for, for the company. Eventually they had to just give up. Okay. Um, the last slide of the, of the night. Um, yeah. So the code isn't perfect. It doesn't solve all the problems but it does help is gradually we, you know, we're getting better over 20 years, things have improved. We've made, you know, inwards uh, improvements in transparency, material, materiality and competency. But, you know, um, if you're um, a clever, competent person, you still can, you know, play games with this. If you're good at it, you can play games. Um, and, you know, out there are, to uh, make sure that you know we stop the sloppy work um, and hold people accountable and I, I think there we still have more work to do uh, in regard to that and so you know I guess you can say a lot of us we know what's right but it doesn't mean much unless we do what's right and there are a few of us out there that have abused it um, you know some of us hot you know some some 
high up there. Um, yeah. So yeah, be weary. I, I think that's the key thing. Always be weary. Buyer beware of anything, you know, kick the tires, trust no one. The, the code is there, but it doesn't mean that it's always right. Um, most of the time it's right. It's not to say that there can't be um, some issues, but if there are, my advice is, you know, ask the question, I guess. Yeah. Thanks, Prof. Um, thank you very much. I think that yeah. was, that was very um, insightful. And I think a lot of the attendees or, well, I definitely um, have a lot of takeaways from this. Um, currently, there aren't any questions. So Everybody think, wants dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I guess one question I could ask is, um, you did say, you know, people need to disclose their CVs and their vols and as much info as possible. Um, I guess I want to talk on the size of the CPs and the big comp and the company itself. Um, where where do you draw the line on you know the amount of information which you're sharing out there in the public domain? Yeah, you share too much. Yeah, there, there is a um, you know we've I mean I I remember one of the gold companies asking that exact question. Um, um, a person was writing and wanting to to get into um, detailed information, and they they. They, you know, our advice was no. That's that, that you don't have to give them, uh, you know, all your trade secrets. The the industry has opened up uh, pretty pretty widely. You know, um, you know. I think I think as long you know, there's a thin line of you know, you don't you don't have to give people everything. But I think what's important for a company and, and certain bigger companies are really pushing hard for good disclosure, very good disclosure. It's is it something that, uh, you know, I think the companies always have to ask themselves and the competent person in the company, um, you know, is the, inf is the inf information material in a, for an investor making a decision? Um, is it a nice to know information or, you know, I don't, do I need to know what the mineral resource or manager makes monthly or annually in order for me to make a decision? No, I don't think I'd need to know that. You know, that, that, you know, maybe it's not the best example, but that is where you, you get people maybe pushing the envelope of information. Um, but, you know, I, I do need to know what your labor bill is um, and, and maybe so I can work it out to, you know, and, and ideally I would like to know what it is in a, a you know, dollar per ton or rand per ton basis. So I think it, it really comes to the, the guiding principle of, common sense, which is not in the code, transparency and material. If it's material, um, usually you need to, to, to let, it, uh, let that information out. Um, even in the United States, they, they, they have a, and, and again, each district might have a different opinion, but what's happening or international code, United States, people say, no, 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 that's classified information. We, and they say, no, um, sorry. You're getting money from the public and the public needs to know that is not classified. That is not sensitive. Um, you need to disclose. Um, other times we've seen it where Samrek will say, no, okay, fair enough. That's sensitive information. You don't need to disclose that. But we're moving closer and closer to, sorry, if you... You're, you're using public money, um, you're going to have to disclose. So we're, we are moving more towards disclosure than less disclosure. But again, it okay. really runs with the, um, the, the, the mining house and, and making informed decisions. Okay, no, well, thanks. Um, last one from me. You see a lot of these competent persons reports flouted around by people trying to sell a coal mine or whatever deposit or resource it is. And, you know, people pretend like that is a P PFSA level kind of work and you can, you know, start banking and investing on that. Well, based on what you just showed us now, we know that's not true. But then um, is there like a guideline for just the layman to actually scrutinize those reports on well, really? Really, uh, the, the, 
you know, it becomes tricky, but that's why, you know, we always try to, you know, um, you know, to me, I think as a, a graduate, you, as a mining engineer, you should have a decent understanding of it as a geologist, you should. But I think if you're, if you're now getting into that kind of thing where you're thinking about investing or, or that, you really would want to, it's in the public domain, you can download it from the SIMM, get the, um, the SAMREC code, use table one at the back, which says, you know, it 5.2 says you must, you know, I don't know what 5.2 is off the top of my head right now, but it says you must, you know, 5.7, you must disclose about the market. Where did you get the price? You say you're going to sell the coal for, you know, $200 a ton. Where did this come from? Do you have an agreement in place, et cetera, et cetera. So there's certain things you'd want to check and you'd use a checklist to, to look at it. And you quickly, quickly will see whether it works or not. Or you phone a friend who, who knows these things and you say, please have a look, does this work? And, and I've had one, you know, um, you know, my wife is a, uh, buys fruit at the vegetable shop. The guy who owns the vegetable shop also invested in a diamond mine and lost about 200,000 rand. And unfortunately I told, you know, all I could tell him was, yeah, this, this, nothing, this report is not worth the paper is written on. So one has to be, you know, beware. Um, and the other thing, I, you know, I'd, I'd highlight is we need, you know, we need to complain more. Um, and it doesn't mean the person will be fired or doesn't mean the person will lose his job or be sanctioned. It's just to correct bad behavior. It's almost like saying out on your street, you know, most of us have children. Your, 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 you know, your, your, your children might be out on the side of the street. Somebody drives down your road very, very fast. You stop and you say, whoa, 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 stop. There's children here. You know, you want to correct the behavior. You're not going to, you don't want to take them to jail and all that. You just want them that the next time he drives down your road, he, he's not going 80 kilometers an hour, but he's going 15. You know, that, that's the kind of thing we need to do with our, our uh, reporting. No, agreed. Yeah. Okay. No, nothing else from my side. Okay. Um, thanks very much, Prof, for taking the time to actually yeah. present to everyone. Um, you will share the presentation. Yeah, and I will give the presentation so that will come out. And like I say, it, it covers a lot, but you know, this is normally it used to be a four hour presentation. It's now shorter. It, it doesn't um, uh, replace reading the code, but um, yeah. So if you're interested, look at the clouds. Um, that'd be my advice. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks all for listening and yeah, great stuff. Thanks.